Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the second quarter of 2023. Welcome to lesson number two, ready for teaching on April 8. The author is Pastor Mark Finlay and your reader is Dr. Percy Harold. The lesson is from the series Three Cosmic Messages and is titled A Moment of Destiny. Sabbath afternoon, April 1. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, once again we thank you for your word and we thank you that in this last book of the Bible, in chapter 14, We have these messages that come to us in the form of, well, they're described as three angels. Lord, as we look at the story of these, as we look at the meaning of them, and as we look at how they relate to us personally, that your Holy Spirit will guide us and bless us. May your word jump out at us and grab our hearts and point us to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And today I'd like to pray for people in various parts of the world. For those who are listening and have uh, contacted us from various parts, and today I'd like to pray for those in Hadspen in Tasmania, or Moragal in New South Wales, and Danita in Middletown, New York, or Miriatus in um, Omaha, Arkansas, or Barbara in Nassau, or Barbara two Barbaras in Granada, and M. Kramer in Utah, and Maggi in Kingston. And it doesn't matter where people are listening, Lord, I pray for each one, whatever their needs are, that they may be satisfied through your love and your grace. Lord, bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Revelation chapter 14, verses 14 and 15. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Let's read that again, Revelation 14, verses 14 and 15. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. God has always spoken to his people, giving them whatever relevant truths they needed to hear at the time. From the warning about the flood in Genesis 6 verse 7 to the first coming of Jesus in Daniel 9, 24 to 27 to the pre-advent judgment of Daniel 7, 9 and 10 and Daniel 8, 14 to final events before Christ's return in Revelation 12 to 14. God has spoken to us. In these last days of human history, he has sent a special message to the world and to his people, designed to meet the need of the hour. He pictures this message as being carried by three angels flying in mid-heaven with their urgent end-time message to all the world. The three angels' messages are Jesus' final message of mercy, a call that leads us from trusting in our own righteousness to trusting the righteousness of Jesus to justify us, to sanctify us, and, at the end of time, to glorify us. As always, though, we must choose Christ to surrender to him and to obey him, and the choices we make now will indeed impact the choices we make in the final crisis ahead of us. Thus, now is the time to prepare. Sunday, April 2. Eternal Choices Revelation 14 is Jesus' final message of mercy to a fallen and rebellious world, one that has, for about 6,000 years, been steeped in sin and evil. There will come a day when every human being on planet Earth will make a final, irrevocable decision either for or against Jesus. Revelation's message of Christ's righteousness 
delivering us from the condemnation of sin, as well as the grip of sin in our lives, will echo and re-echo throughout the earth. Read Matthew 24.14 and compare it with Revelation 14 verse 6. What promise did Jesus give to his disciples regarding the worldwide spread of the gospel before his return? Matthew 24 verse 14 And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. And Revelation 14 verse 6 Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Jesus promised that this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world, given in Matthew 24 verse 14, finds its final fulfilment in Christ's last day message in Revelation 14 verse 6, which says that the gospel is proclaimed to every nation, tribe, tongue and people. Three times in Revelation 22, Jesus says that he is coming quickly. Revelation 22 verse 7 Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. And verse 12 And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. And verse 20 He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. In the context of his soon return, our Lord adds in verse 11, He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. Revelation moves to one glorious climax in which every person is led to decide for or against Christ. Of course, Every day, by our choices, even in the little things, we are choosing either for or against Jesus. It's not likely that someone constantly making the wrong choices in their life now will suddenly, in the final crisis, come forward on the side of Jesus, especially when the force of the whole evil world is against them. Now, Today and every day we must choose to be faithful to Christ and to his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, we read in 1 John 5.3. As Ellen G. White has said, Jesus does not change the character at his coming. The work of transformation must be done now. Our daily lives are determining our destiny. And that's from Last Day Events, page 295. And so, to finish today, how does God shape our characters? What means does he use for us to grow in grace? What can we do to more fully allow the Holy Spirit to transform us to be more like Jesus? Monday, April 3. The Son of Man Returns. Revelation 14 contains the key text in regard to the Lord's last day message to his people and to the world. Central to it all is the return of Jesus, the fulfilment of his promise that you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Mark 14, verse 62. Read Revelation 14, verse 14. What title is used to describe Jesus as he returns to earth? Why do you think John uses this title for Jesus? Revelation 14, verse 14. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Jesus used the term Son of Man to refer to himself 82 times in the Gospels. It was one of his favourite titles. He used it as an expression of endearment to identify with us. 
He is the Saviour who understands us, has experienced our temptations, and has passed through our trials. He is the Son of Man who is returning to take us home. The Jesus who comes for us is the same Jesus who lived among us. He is qualified to redeem us because he became one of us, and yet, as one of us, he met the full fury of Satan's temptations, and yes, was victorious. What do we learn from the following Bible verses in Matthew about Jesus, the Son of Man? Matthew 16.27 For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. And Matthew 24, verse 27, For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. And verse 30, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and and great glory. And Matthew 25, verses 31 and 32, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will gather before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. Notice some elements in these passages. 1. Jesus, the Son of Man, is coming in glory with his angels. 2. He will divide the sheep from the goats, basically a judgment. 3. The destiny of the nations and all humanity will be decided for eternity. And so to finish today, think about the term Son of Man and what it says of Christ's humanity. Though God, he became one of us, just like us, but unlike us, he never sinned. What amazing hope does this offer to you in terms of one, knowing God's love for us, and two, knowing that he can relate to your struggles and give you victory over them. Tuesday, April 4, The Heavenly Judgment Read Revelation chapter 14, verse 14 again, and Acts chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. What similarities do you discover? Revelation 14, verse 4. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Acts 1, beginning at verse 9. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. John states that, I looked and behold a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, in Revelation 14 verse 14. When Jesus ascended to heaven, Luke records in Acts chapter 1 verse 9, that as the disciples stood gazing up into heaven, while they watched, he, Jesus, was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Jesus ascended in a cloud of angels and will return with a cloud of angels. The angels then declared to the amazing disciples in Acts 1.11, This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. There is a divine truth embedded in this passage that may not be apparent. This same Jesus, the Son of Man, the one who walked the dusty streets of Nazareth, ministered in the crowded streets of Jerusalem, healed the sick in the villages of Israel, and preached on the grassy hillsides of Galilee, is coming again. The Son of Man also is mentioned in the light of the judgment in Daniel chapter 7. Read Daniel 7 verses 9, 
10, 13 and 14. Why did Daniel call Jesus the Son of Man in something as serious as the judgment? What given what we have already looked at should be comforting in knowing that the Son of Man is so central to the judgment. Daniel 7 verse 9 I watched till thrones were put in place and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. And verse 10, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was opened and the books were opened. And verses 13 and 14, I was watching in the night visions and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed." In Daniel 7, 9 and 10, Daniel sees the seating of the heavenly court with 10,000 times 10,000 angelic heavenly beings gathered around the throne. The judgment is set and the books, the celestial record of our lives, are opened before the universe. In Daniel 7 verses 13 and 14, the Son of Man approaches the Ancient of Days, the Father, and receives his eternal kingdom. The judgment reveals before the entire universe that the Father, Son and Holy Spirit have done everything possible to save all humanity. This judgment vindicates not only the saints, but also God's own character against the false charges of Satan. See Job chapter 1 and chapter 2 and Psalm 51 verses 1 to 5. And in Job chapter 1 we read that there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, that's in verse 1, and that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. And he had all sorts of problems occur because Satan attacked him. Now, in verse 6, it says there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, who one who fears God and shuns evil? And then you'll remember the story in those two chapters about how Job remained loyal to God, although there were all sorts of difficulties and tragedies occurring in his life. And so we look at Psalm 51, verses 1 to 4. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned, and done this evil in your sight." that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. So to finish today, think about the fact that your whole life will come under scrutiny before God. What then is your only hope when this happens? And we're referred to Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. And I'd like to read it from the New Living Translation copy that a friend of mine, Dr. Ray Swinnell, gave me when I conducted the funeral for his wife. Romans 8, 1 reads, So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Wednesday, April 5, The Victor's Crown 
John describes Jesus as the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle, in Revelation 14, verse 14. The word for crown is stephanos. It is a victor's crown. When an athlete won an important contest, he was given a stephanos, a crown of honour, of glory, of victory. Jesus once wore a crown of thorns, symbolising shame and mockery. He once was despised and rejected of men. He was reviled, ridiculed, spat upon, beaten and whipped. But now he wears a crown of glory and comes again, but now as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Read Revelation 14.15 and Mark 4 verses 26 to 29. What similarities do you see between the texts? What are they both talking about? Revelation 14 and verse 15. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And Mark chapter 4, beginning at verse 26. And he said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground, and should sleep by night and rise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow, he himself does not know how. For the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, after that the full grain of the head. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. The angel comes from the presence of of God in the glory of the temple and says, It's time. The harvest is fully ripe. Go and get your children and bring them home. Jesus uses illustrations from agriculture repeatedly in the New Testament. On more than one occasion, he uses the symbolism of a ripening harvest to illustrate the growth of the seed of the gospel in the lives of his people. The germination of the seed Ellen White writes in Christ Object Lessons, page 65 to 66, represents the beginning of spiritual growth and the development of the plant is a beautiful figure of Christ's growth. As in nature, so in grace. There can be no life without growth. The plant must either grow or die. As its growth is silent and imperceptible but continuous, so is the development of the Christian life. At every stage of development, our life may be perfect. Yet, if Christ's purpose for us is fulfilled, there will be continual advancement. Sanctification is the work of a lifetime. As our opportunities multiply, our experience will enlarge and our knowledge increase. End of quote. The ripening of the golden grain represents all those transformed by grace, motivated by love, and living obedient lives to the glory of Christ's name. Their hearts are one with Jesus' heart, and all they want is what he wants. And so to finish today, how do you understand Ellen G. White's statement that at every stage of development, our life may be perfect? What does that mean? Especially when we can see our faults and defective characters now. Thursday, April 6. Every seed produces a harvest. In Revelation 14, there are two harvests. The harvest of golden grain represents the righteous, and the harvest of the gory grapes represents the unrighteous or the lost. Both harvests are fully ripe. Every seed sown is fully mature. Read Revelation 14, verses 17 to 20. What does the expression, the great winepress of the wrath of God, mean? Also, look at Revelation 14.10, Revelation 15.1 and Revelation 16.1. Well, let's start with Revelation 14.17 to 20. Then another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, who had power over fire, and he cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, 
Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city, and blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles for one thousand six hundred furlongs. And Revelation 14 and verse 10. He himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And Revelation 15 verse 1. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvellous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. And Revelation 16 verse 1. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. Another angel came out from the altar who had great power over fire, we read in Revelation 14 verse 18. Here is the angel who commands the fires of God's final judgment. The harvest is ripe. Sin has reached its limits. Rebellion has crossed the line of God's mercy. As evil and bad as things have been, it's going to get even worse before it's all over. A loving God has done everything he can do for us, which included offering himself on the cross as a sacrifice for our sin. For, as we read in 2 Corinthians 5.21, He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And in Galatians 3 verse 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. What more could God have done beyond that cross? There is nothing more grace can do to redeem those who have repeatedly rejected the Holy Spirit. Here is the urgent prophetic message of Revelation 14. Every seed has gone to harvest. The grain is fully ripe, and the grapes are fully ripe. The people of God reveal His image of grace, compassion, mercy, and love before the universe. The children of the evil one reveal greed, lust, jealousy, and hate. The character of Jesus is revealed in one group, and the character of Satan is the other. The universe will see in the people of God a revelation of righteousness that perhaps no generation before it has ever witnessed. In contrast to the righteousness of Christ revealed in his people, the universe will see the full results of rebellion against God. Wickedness, evil, sin and lawlessness will be on full display before men and angels. The contrast between good and evil, right and wrong, obedience and disobedience will be apparent to all the universe, to both humans and angels. And so, to finish today, how well can you discern the contrast between good and evil? Why is it important that we do? Well, let's finish with Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 14. And that reads... But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Friday, April 7. From the book The Great Controversy, page 555, we read... It is a law of both of the intellectual and the spiritual nature that by beholding we become changed. The mind gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it is allowed to dwell. It becomes assimilated to that which it is accustomed to love and reverence. Man will never rise higher than his standard of purity or goodness or truth. 
If self is his loftiest ideal, he will never attain to anything more exalted. Rather, he will constantly sink lower and lower. The grace of God alone has power to exalt man. Left to himself, his course must inevitably be downward. End of quote. Subtly, imperceptibly, almost unnoticed at first, our characters and our personalities change based on the seeds that we are sowing in our minds. Sow good seeds, and you will produce good fruit. Sow the evil seeds of this world, and you will produce the fruit of this world in your character. If we sow indifference to God and spiritual values and priorities, we reap the fruit of indifference, apathy, spiritual complacency and frustration in our spiritual lives. This is why those who think, well, I know that one day final persecution will come, the mark of the beast and so forth, but when it does, then I will get it together, are choosing a very dangerous path. God calls us now, at this moment, to surrender our lives to Him. The longer one delays responding to the Holy Spirit, the harder and harder one's soul becomes to the prompting of God, and more susceptible to fall for and believe in the lies of the evil one. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. 1. What is the relationship between being saved by grace and growing in grace in the context of Revelation 14, verses 14 to 20, and the harvest principle? Let's read those texts again. Revelation 14, beginning at verse 14, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the crowd, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire, and he cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city, and blood came out of the winepress, up to the horses' bridles, for one thousand six hundred furlongs. And question two, discuss the elements necessary for the growth of plants, and compare them to those necessary for our spiritual growth. What are the similarities? That is, what can we learn from how plants grow that we can apply to our own lives? 3. Is there a difference between our God-given ability to choose and willpower? Why is understanding this difference important for the growing Christian? And 4. Why is the title Son of Man an encouragement in the judgment hour as we anticipate the second coming of Christ? Why is it comforting to realize that a man, a human being, is up there representing us in the judgment? And this lesson was recorded on my wife and I's 57th wedding anniversary. And now it's time for our inside story, our mission story for this week. And once again, it's read by Sibylla. Thank you, Sibylla. 700 Former Rebels Baptised by Andrew McChesney The Philippines were mired in conflict with rebels on Mindoro Island for 52 years. Land and money were offered to the rebels in exchange for peace. But nothing seemed to work. A seemingly endless cycle of ambushes and counterattacks left 40,000 people dead. In 2017, Adventist World Radio, AWR, began broadcasting in Mindoro as part of a Seventh-day Adventist World Church initiative known as TMI Evangelism. TMI stands for Total Member Involvement. 
a program that encourages every church member to bring someone to Jesus. AWR leased time on local radio stations and local church members got involved by giving Bible studies and inviting neighbours to evangelistic meetings. About 1,400 people were baptised at the meetings and the broadcasts continued. In 2019, rebels holed up in the, in the lush, green mountains of Mindoro began to listen to AWR. As COVID-19 swept through the world in 2020, a number of them decided to surrender to Jesus. Rebel leader Carl Martin could not understand what was happening and he started to listen to AWR. He was hiding in the jungle, watching and trying to figure out why his fighters were leaving him, said AWR President Dwayne McKay. So he started listening to the radio. Martin was responsible for the deaths of dozens of people, including 21 soldiers whom he ambushed while they slept and shot dead with one of their own machine guns. But as he listened to AWR, he also decided to give his heart to Jesus. A bloodstained chapter of Philippine history drew to a close when about 700 former rebels, including Martin and his wife, laid down their weapons and were baptised at AWR-led evangelistic meetings. In all, over 60,000 people were baptised during the Earth's final countdown meetings across the Philippines about a year ago. What bullets couldn't do, God has done, Mackay said. The Philippine government has granted amnesty to the former rebels. AWR is working with the government and a non-governmental organisation, ASI, member Farm Stew, to help the former rebels earn a livelihood through farming. We won't stop the AWR broadcast, said Mackay, who also serves as an assistant to the General Conference President and is in charge of total member involvement. The local churches are now running the broadcasts and we provide the sermons. The lay people make this happen. This is a perfect example of total member involvement. Greetings, Sabbath School friends around the world. My name is Emma Garrick, a final year nursing student at Avondale University in Kurumbong, Australia. You have been listening to my grandfather, Percy Harold, reading the text of the Adult Bible Study Guide with this week's Sabbath School lesson. He has been doing this for free since 1996, long before I was born initially read as Eyes for the Visually Impaired through Christian Services for the Blind in Australia and New Zealand. It became a podcast in July 2007, and so became available to anyone around the world. In 2021, Pa's podcast became the reading podcast for the official General Conference Sabbath School app, with daily recordings of each day of the lesson. The podcasts of the reading of the Sabbath School lessons are available from Hope Channel Australia, primarily on SoundCloud, and thence on multiple podcast rebroadcasters, including Apple iTunes. For several years, it has also been available in YouTube format, with the voice of my grandfather syncing in time with the scrolling of the text of the lesson, including all the reference texts. And for the visually impaired in the North American division, it is available on CD from Christian Record Services out of Nebraska. Hope Channel Germany distributes it to the blind in Europe. You are over one of 40,000 who listen every week around the globe. Tell your friends to look up my grandfather on the internet. It is simple. Just search for Dr. Percy Harold, select the site you want to listen to, make it a favourite on your device, and be able to listen again anytime you like. But downloading the General Conference Sabbath School app is a sure way to listen daily. That is the one with the blue rectangular icon, with a stylized globe and three angels superimposed. And, as my grandfather would say each week, Remember, God is always faithful.